Hello, I'm Lev Rothenberg, Director of Arts and Education at the JCC, and I welcome you all. Tonight is the kickoff of our 23rd and Cats Festival of Books and Arts. I am very, very excited. I cannot imagine a better start than with the film about the enormously influential and wise Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, followed by a discussion with the talented filmmaker Martin Doblmeyer and with Susanna Heschel, the rabbi's daughter and a scholar in her own right. Personally, this really is very important to me. If any of you have ever received an email from me, you will notice that on the signature line, there is a quote and it says, when I was young, I admired clever people. Now that I am older, I admire kind people. And that quote is from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. I'd like to take a minute to extend thanks to our partner and sponsor, Congregation Bethel Zedek, and also to Lily Endowment for their generous support and specifically Chris Coble and Brian Williams for all they do to improve our community. I hope that you will return to our virtual and Cats Festival Books and Arts. We have so many wonderful things. For example, tomorrow night, please join me in welcoming Rachel Beanland, a wonderful author of the best-selling award-winning novel, Florence Adler Swims Forever. And then on Thursday, Local news anchor and JCC member Angela Brower is in conversation with Ira Rosen, 24 Emmy Award winning producer of 60 Minutes and the author of the new book, Ticking Clock. You will learn amazing inside scoops behind the biggest stories and the biggest storytellers of the last 25 years. To find out more and to get tickets, simply go to our website, jccindy.org, jccindy.org. Now, let's talk about what we're going to do tonight. In a couple minutes, we will begin viewing the wonderful film, Spiritual Audacity. After that, Rabbis Dennis and Sandy Sasso will introduce Martin Doblemeyer and Susanna Heschel, followed by a conversation with the two of them moderated by Rabbi Den Dennis Sasso. And then after that, we'll have maybe 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A. You may wonder, how can you do questions and answers when you can't talk? Well, it's easy. We have a tab at the bottom of the screen. Simply type your questions in on that tab. And you can type them in at any point. You don't have to wait till we say, please type in your questions. I'd like to take a minute to tell you a bit about my friends, Rabbis Sandy and Dennis Sasso, who will welcome Martin and Susanna following the screening of the film. Rabbi Sandy Sasso is the Rabbi Emerita of Congregation Beth El Zedek, where she served for 36 years. She's president, presently, she's the Director of Religion, Spirituality, and the Arts at IUP Arts and Humanities, award-winning author of over 20 children's books. And I have a feeling if we were talking next year, it would be of over 22 or 23. Um, she serves on the editorial board of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, Indianapolis Indiana Humanities, IUPUI Board of Advisors, co-founder of Women for Change of Indiana, and the first woman ordained by Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Yes, she's a busy woman. Rabbi Dennis Sasso, probably most importantly, is the husband of Rabbi Sandy Sasso. But there we go. In addition to that, he is the senior rabbi of Congregation Beth El Zedek, where he has served for, since 1977, affiliate professor of Jewish studies at the Christian Theological Seminary, founding member and past president of the Reconstructionist, Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association. He writes and is active in civic and interfaith initiatives 
in the state and beyond. And I personally am very grateful for the work he's done for our community. And along with Sandy, he is a member of the first cohort of Jewish legends of Indiana. What people may not know is he was born and raised in Panama. So Rabbi Dennis and Rabbi Sandy's smiling faces will be greeting you following the film. And now I present Spiritual Audacity, the Abraham Joshua Heschel story. On the front lines of the historic Civil Rights March in Selma, Alabama, standing along with Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most remarkable religious figures of the 20th century, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. I think they became friends, but more than friends, they became brothers. He was the authority on the prophets, but on this occasion, he was the prophet. <laughs> Abraham Heschel is plucked from the fire of the Holocaust that will take the life of his mother and sisters. And in 1940, he arrives in America. And he's already come out of this magnificent dynasty of rabbis that go back for centuries. He's part of a dynastic royalty. He lived in excruciating ways with the reality that as the world and the family he grew up in was destroyed in Europe, most of the world was in fact indifferent. Remember, in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Over the next three decades, Heschel fights indifference through his vision of a God who seeks to partner with humanity. To be in real connection to God was to be in awe and radical amazement at the universe that God had created. And his love for the prophets of the Hebrew Bible who dare speak truth to power. And Heschel taught that each of us has a choice to make. What side of history do we ultimately want to land on? He was kind of a theological Hemingway. He wrote in short, pithy aphorisms of enormous power. Heschel plays a pivotal role in reshaping the contentious relationship between Catholics and Jews. But I also have to remind them that my being Jewish is so sacred to me that I am ready to die for it and he risks being in the forefront of the protests against what he believes is an immoral war in Vietnam. My father was attacked for so many of the public positions that he took. My father wouldn't be quiet. No one could silence him. I am an optimist against my better judgment. And somehow, I believe in God. And somehow, I believe and am convinced that he will have mercy and pity more than we deserve. Major funding for this program was provided by Lilly Endowment. Additional funding provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, Mark and Michelle Gary, Louis Grossman, the Gary Bialis Family Fund of the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles, Cosette Charitable Fund, and Skip and Fran Minikowski. On March 7, 1965, a day that would be known as America's Bloody Sunday, civil rights activists take to the streets in Selma, Alabama. They march because so many black Americans are being denied the right to vote. You came down to make a mockery out of this courthouse, and we are not going to have it. When the demonstrators cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they are met on the other side with a show of force. But Dr. King himself said that you have to be certifiably insane to think that this handful of crazy young people with no power and no money can change America. And on this day, trying to change America will be very painful. They decided, uh, evidently, that they wanted to teach us a lesson. You are ordered to stop, stand where you are. This march will not continue. 
before anybody could do anything, they just charged into the group on horseback. They started throwing tear gas and they, they just beat up everybody they could. After we had been beaten, left bloody, I had a concussion on the bridge. I thought I was going to die. I thought I, I saw death. It was such a visible expression of hatred and disregard. It awakened the conscience of the nation. Martin Luther King Jr. understands a public response, a public outcry is called for. And Martin Luther King Jr. made this unbelievable appeal for religious leaders to come to Selma. Many rabbis, priests, nuns, and ministers came. Over the next two weeks, thousands make their way to Selma. One clergyman the movement feels is critical to attend is a writer and theologian from New York, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. There's an old tradition in Judaism saying that if I see evil in another human being, it's an indication that there must be something of that evil in myself, and vice versa. If I see something good in a person, it is a sign there's something of that same good in me. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was the real thing when it comes to prophetic witness. He was told. Others were told, if you go down there, you may not come back. You make sure you make arrangements with your family if you don't make it. These were moral issues. These were moral decisions and moral commitments. And it was clear what you have to do. Dr. King wanted a presence that would suggest something larger than only a black-led movement. You know, his greatest skill, in my view, was that he always put one foot in the Constitution and one foot in the scriptures. He always said, this is about right and wrong, this is about justice, this is not just about black and white. And for the civil rights movement, Heschel's presence holds a special significance. We, in African American, church would uh, from time to time compare ourselves to the children of Israel. We identify with that struggle. Uh, we have been held as slaves, held in bondage. The children of Israel had been reduced to the bondage of physical slavery. They were exploited economically, dominated politically, and humiliated by the power structure of Egypt. Then came that glad day when God sent a Moses. Let my people go. I mean, the black church was almost always grounded in Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And that was the metaphor, the storyline that Dr. King brought over into the civil rights movement. So we adopted the Old Testament story as our story. Heschel is the person who, through his studies and writings, brought to life Hebrew prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos. Now we do, Rabbi Heschel, his very presence was a kind of a spiritual authority. We had read his book on the prophets. Uh, he was the authority on the prophets, but on this occasion, he was the prophet. <laughs> it was almost like you had somebody that walked out of the Old Testament and got in the front of the line. He saw and knew and understood that you can't take Torah seriously. You can't take the Hebrew Bible seriously and not then translate the encounter between Moses and Pharaoh into the immediate, into understanding what was happening with race relations in America. It is a great wonder that given the incredible pedigree that Heschel had, uh, how he came to understand the biblical text from below 
and how he was able to engage with questions of social justice and oppression. But for the people around Dr. King, they were always interested in ecumenical relationships beyond the black church because it was a movement trying to reach out. And Heschel struck them immediately as somebody who was reaching out farther than they were. There is a story that when Heschel went with a delegation of rabbis to Birmingham, Alabama, they were met at the airport by the local rabbis who said, please turn around and go home because you're gonna make life really hard for us. We understand where your sympathies are and we might agree with those sympathies. We have to live in this reality and you're gonna cause massive anti-Semitism and we're gonna be the victims of it. There can be no compromise. We can only have law and order as long as the white man rules. You always worried about violence. In fact, we were told by the Justice Department that they didn't want Dr. King to march because they had word that there were snipers along the way planning to kill him. And he didn't pay any attention to it. A lot of people didn't want to be on the front line. They're afraid to be victims of the first line of attack. Hesha had no problem being on the front line. Uh, didn't find with the struggle. I said the best of Judaism is fighting against racism. For Heschel, marching becomes a form of prayer. He would later say, I felt my legs were praying. And he said, if Isaiah, if Ezekiel, if Jeremiah were here, they would be shaking a finger at the community. It's always remembering the prophets chastised the people, but they loved the people of Israel. Well, Heschel, and I would say Dr. Martin Luther King, and Obviously, they loved America, but they felt America was not living up to its potential greatness. Prophets are the ones that take people out of their sense of comfort and complicity. The prophets are ones that see an injustice in one place and see that as an injustice everywhere. Man is not man because of what he has in common with the earth, but because of what he has in common with God. The Greeks, sought to understand man as a part of the universe. The prophets sought to understand man as a partner of God. Heschel understands that he and other Jewish leaders are being called to create community with other Christians, despite the fact that a generation earlier, too many Christians were indifferent during the Holocaust. We cannot exist separate and apart from the rest of humanity. And this was a particularly potent and powerful call, especially in light of the, the Holocaust and the sense of abandonment that so many Jews felt when it seemed like the rest of the world, you know, didn't lift a finger to, to help and support our community. My father was living in Nazi Germany where the Christian theologians were debating whether they should throw the Old Testament out of the, the Bible because it's a Jewish book. To come to America and to meet someone like Martin Luther King, who made the Hebrew Bible central to the civil rights movement. The only normalcy that we will settle for is the normalcy that allows judgment to run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And who drew from this incredibly rich tradition of African-American religiosity and theology that makes the prophets and the exodus central. This is completely new for my father. His insistence that Jews needed to show up and show up on the front lines of the civil rights movement, the movement for black equality and black rights in America, was something that many of his colleagues and many Jews of that generation did not agree with or believe. The racism in itself is, for Heschel, a great sin. It's evil. And he is talking about this in the 50s and 60s at a time where the word structural racism doesn't exist. My father used to say, if there's any hope for the future of Judaism in America, it lies with the black church. Why? Because there's a piety, a religiosity that he remembered from when he was growing up in, in Warsaw. Abraham Joshua Heschel is born in Warsaw, Poland, 1907. The family is poor, but Heschel descends from a line of Orthodox Jewish royalty, Hasidic rebbies dating back centuries. 
Because of his ancestry and the role of a Rebbe in a community, adults would rise when he would enter the room. He would be lifted up on a table and he would give a sermon, the age of five, six, seven years old, a little boy, and he would speak. He was brilliant. Hasidism is not any one particular movement. It means the pious ones. It is a blending of a medieval mystical tradition into a traditionalist mitzvah, commandment-driven lifestyle. It's the understanding that God is, plays a role in every aspect of one's life. But also in that, the Hasidim see a lot of joy in this relationship with God. Hasidism was uh, taking Judaism and bringing it to life for ordinary people who didn't necessarily have the background that these scholars had through dancing, through singing, through chanting, and through um, genuine expressions of love. Heschel would later write that although he was born in Warsaw, he felt his cradle was in a small town in Ukraine where the founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov, lived his last years. The Baal Shem Tov, which means the master of the good name, that was the rabbi of the 18th century in Eastern Europe, who rebelled against the, we would say the classicism, the rigidity that he saw in the traditional Judaism of his day. And so he brought to Judaism a sense of, of wonderment, of joy, not just of a, a serious Talmudic studies. Where I think that the Hasidic influence is with him all the time is in that almost, you know, acutely, almost physical sense that God is there. Eastern European Jews, kind of not as affected or transformed by the modern world, had a much keener sense of, oh, God is here. In 1927, at the age of 20, Heschel leaves Poland to study philosophy at the University of Berlin, Germany. Germany, again, was, was, was thought of as, as being a mecca for liberal education in that period. So in the 1920s and 30s, it had a philosophical, scientific, academic tradition going back generations. It's, it's where people came from across the world to be educated. While studying at the university, Heschel, already an ordained rabbi, continues his Judaic studies by attending both the liberal Hochschule and the traditional Orthodox seminary. Heschel, in, in his 20s, already has this mastery of the entire Jewish canon. Heschel walks in knowing the Talmud, knowing the Midrash, knowing the Hasidic stories, knowing the Hasidic tales. He's walking around in Berlin. He's thinking about whatever philosophical questions came up in class that day, and he notices the sun is setting. He says something like, you know, at that moment I remembered that as a Jew my job is to respond to the sunset. So he begins to pray, right? And there, that's not your usual Berlin graduate student in philosophy and Bible, right? That's a very different picture. One of the things that Heschel charged us to do was really to hold the complexities that that there's a tendency to try to, to try to choose either spiritual depth or intellectual rigor. And for Heschel, by, by nature, both of those things were, were not only natural for him, but were actually absolutely essential to him. And I think when you're coming from a Hasidic milieu, which had lived somewhat apart from the larger world, here's Heschel saying, we have to be part of this larger world. It's, it's not a luxury that we can afford to be off in our own enclaves. We've got to be out there in the world fighting for the world. So for Heschel, the theme he turns to for his doctoral work is a study of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. Exploring their consciousness, the young Heschel discovers their passion, not only for God's will, but inner life, a God who cares for and needs humanity. I've learned from the prophets they have to be involved in the affairs of men the affairs of suffering men. The biggest message of the Bible, of the prophets of Israel, is that God takes men seriously. For Heschel, in many ways, the core idea in the theology of the Hebrew Bible is the idea that God cares, what he calls the divine pathos. 
God is moved by people's suffering and God is offended by oppression and degradation. And a prophet is someone who is so identified with God's pathos that it takes him over, right? Prophets are overcome by God. Jeremiah actually talks about feeling completely overcome by the force of God's passion. Now, when you say prophet to a person today, well, they think someone who predicts the future. It's prophetic. That's not what a Hebrew prophet was. The Hebrew word is navi, navi. It means truth teller, telling the truth, facing the truth, coming to a community and telling the community things it doesn't always want to hear. Prophets are not popular. Heschel observes that to humanity, a single act of injustice injures the welfare of the people. But to the prophet, even a minor injustice takes on what he calls cosmic proportions. And the prophets are always there to remind us that you might be comfortable in what you're doing, you might be comfortable in your sense of right and wrong, but as long as there is violence in the world, as long as there is injustice in the world, we're all complicit in it because it's as long as it's somewhere, it's everywhere. He understood that the prophetic tradition of the Hebrew Bible uh, is about this God who has so entered into history with all of its aches and pains and hurts and disappointments, and that this God remains faithful. We have no other book like Heschel's On the Prophets uh, because he dares to think that this poetic testimony uh, by the prophets is the truth of who God is. But as Heschel finishes his work on the prophets, Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists are on the rise across Germany. They stoke centuries-old contempt for the Jewish faith and add a newer component of disdain for Jews as a people. The theory behind all of this is that the Jews belonged to a reprobate people, to a people who had been cursed by God because of killing God. That's in some ways the center of Christian and Judaism is the idea that Jews uh, collectively were responsible for the, for the killing of Christ. Anti-Semitism itself was a word that, that was invented in the 1870s to describe a modern phenomenon, which was contempt for, the, for Jews as a people. Under the Nazis, anti-Semitism becomes the law of the land. Jewish property is confiscated. Jewish professors and civil servants lose their jobs. Concentration camps, once for political prisoners, are expanding. In October 1938, Heschel and other Polish Jews are arrested and deported. Within weeks, Jewish synagogues and businesses are systematically torched. Heschel's future hangs in the balance. The story of American Judaism in the 20th century is a story of immigration. And all of them are in some way or another fleeing oppression. In the late 1930s, thousands of Jews are desperately trying to escape Europe too few are allowed to enter the United States. So much of Jewish history is about movement, about living in a place, making it a home, and then ultimately being exiled or expelled from that place after persecution and needing to go and establish a new place. And so this becomes kind of core to Jewish identity. I believe on some level, Heschel was the embodiment of that journey. By early 1940, the German army has already begun to bring its reign of terror and murder across Europe. Like so many institutions, the Catholic Church was unable or unwilling to offer effective resistance. Under Pius XII, who became Pope in January of 1939, that the papacy did not speak out strongly against the Nazi regime. The reason was con concern that this would lead to the destruction of the Catholic Church as an entity throughout Central Europe. If there had been an open criticism of the Nazi regime, it would have had severe repercussions for, for, for Catholics. And with the Nazi efforts to discredit the Hebrew Bible, German Jews are effectively stripped of the voice of their prophets. 
So in part, it was my father's dissertation was to repudiate that tradition of German theology that denigrated the prophets. And it really is a terribly unfortunate thing because they made it impossible for Germany to call on the prophetic tradition of just of social justice. They didn't give them the resources to protest when Hitler was coming to power. In March 1940, Julian Morgenstern, president of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, Ohio, secures visas for Heschel and four other Jewish scholars to leave Europe and teach in America. Heschel's mother and three sisters remain in Europe. When he lands in Cincinnati as an assistant professor of Jewish theology at the Hebrew Union College Reform Jewish Seminary, he finds that most of the students and teachers aren't terribly interested in Hasidic piety. They're not interested in mitzvot, commandments. They're not in interested even um, in the study of Jewish law, so much so that you couldn't get kosher food in their cafeteria. And America itself is a culture shock for Heschel. Whereas in Germany, he was reading Goethe and Hegel and Kant and discussing the finer aspects of music theory, culture, art, etc. In America, they're talking about televisions, automobiles, homes, and it seems spiritually vacuous. Man is willing to define himself as a seeker after the maximum degree of comfort for the minimum expenditure of energy. He feels, acts, and thinks as if the sole purpose of the universe were to satisfy his needs. Heschel was very grateful, obviously, to be in the United States, his life saved during World War II, but he was not happy, he was not um, compatible with the ethos, the religious ethos. At a social gathering in Cincinnati, Heschel meets a woman from California, Sylvia Strauss. She was gifted as a pianist, and my mother played, and my father thought, my mother was quite wonderful and uh, invited her out. They date, and there is a spark. But Sylvia returns to the West Coast, and the two will not meet again for several years. Heschel's going to come to the United States and rouse this generation of Jews, which knows that, like him, it's privileged to be alive. He calls himself a brand plucked from the fire. But in that way, all of the Jews in America, to some extent, know that because they're reading the newspapers and they're watching their cousins, literally their cousins, who are caught in Europe, being gassed. You know, I kill Hitler because I don't consider him human anymore. You know, I kill Hitler because he is a beast, the dangerous beast. According to an ancient Jewish dictum, he who saves one man is regarded as if he saved all men. He who destroys one man is regarded as if he destroyed all men. This is a person who was forced to watch as his whole world, the world he grew up in, the world he was educated in, his family, his teachers, all of it was obliterated while the world essentially sat silently by. He had an incredibly keen, almost excruciating sense of the moral consequences of indifference. Right? The Jews were murdered, no one did anything. So he saw his own war on indifference as a kind of reaction to the horror of living in a world where indifference was rampant. By the end of the war, Heschel will lose his mother and three sisters to the Nazi horror, adding to the millions of others who perished. Many ask, where was God? Heschel would respond, why are you bringing that question to God? God should bring that question to you. You want to say to God, where were you? God's answer is, well, where were you? The way we live and conduct ourselves in the world has to be a counter testimony to Auschwitz, has to be a radical alternative to that way of being. If modernity, in his mind, leads to the degradation of human beings, what it means to be a Jew in the modern world to a significant degree is to fight with everything we have for the dignity of people who are degraded. In 1945, Heschel leaves Hebrew Union College and joins the faculty 
at the conservative Jewish Theological Seminary on the Upper West Side of New York. JTS will be Heschel's home for the rest of his career, although it's not without its challenges. It's a place that's focused on Talmud and history. His colleagues don't really understand what he's doing or why he's doing it. He wants to talk about piety. They want to talk about textual scholarship. He was a professor of mysticism. This was the last thing in the world that they wanted. <laughs> they, were, you know, to, to, they, they were trying to say, we're serious scholars. We want to be considered the Harvard of the Jewish world. From his new post, Heschel gains insight into Judaism across America. One of his chief concerns is for the future of institutional religion in the modern world. The centerpiece of, of Heschel's kind of attack or criticism on the religious establishment was the synagogue, these institutions that were established to hold the sacred, but he claimed over the course of time had become empty and, and void and vapid. And he even at one point writes, has the synagogue become the graveyard where prayer is buried? And, and, and his claim was not that we should do away with these institutions, but that we had to reclaim them. In New York, Heschel rekindles his relationship with Sylvia Strauss, and in 1946, they marry. She gives him a sense of, of home in which he can reorient his theological wanderings. It's said even in Jewish tradition that the great Jewish thinkers don't fully get a sense of their potential until they're married, because how can you talk about a partnership with God and doing the work of creation with God if you don't actually have a living partner in time. My mother's ideal was for her to sit down at the piano first thing in the morning and just play for hours and hours. That's what she wanted to do, and he wanted to go to his desk. So in that sense, they were very compatible. My mother had her piano, my father had his writing. 1948 marks an historic moment for Jews around the world, the founding of the State of Israel. So Israel was seen as the one place where many Jews thought they could find safety. We could no longer count on the good ethical consciousness of the world when the ethical consciousness wasn't there. Israel, Heschel insists, is not atonement. And to call it compensation, he says, would be blasphemy. We do not worship the soil. Instead, Israel is endowed with the power to inspire moments in which God's presence is palpable. But Heschel wanted it to be a Jewish state, not just the, the fact that the majority were Jews, but it was living up to Jewish tradition the way that Heschel understood Jewish traditions. Back home in America, Heschel begins a remarkably prolific period of writing, and his work is reaching a wider audience. 1951, Man is Not Alone, explores how human beings can only express wonder, awe, and what he calls radical amazement at the world around them. He was famous for talking about um, the ineffable, God as that which cannot be expressed. Um, and sometimes people at the seminary would, would laugh behind his back and say, well, if it can't be expressed, how come he's got so many books about it? But, but the truth is, is that the books were pointing at a reality that you could only fully understand by having the experience that he was talking about. Wonder for Heschel is the alternative to expediency. He essentially says people face a choice. We can live in what he calls the way of expediency, where we go through the world asking how the world can serve us, how we can use things, exploit them, or we can choose the way of wonder in which we are fundamentally filled with a sense of gratitude, of indebtedness, a sense that something is asked of us, a sense that we are called to serve. America's leading public theologian Reinhold Niebuhr of Union Theological Seminary writes a glowing review of Man is Not Alone, saying Heschel is destined to become a commanding authoritative voice in the religious life of America. The two form a unique and lifelong friendship. But it's Heschel's book on the Sabbath that reaches well beyond the Jewish audience. He takes a core commandment of ancient Judaism and through his prose and sense of mysticism offers the Sabbath as an antidote for the modern world. The Sabbath, Shabbat in, in Hebrew, is the central aspect of Jewish practice, of Jewish halakha, Jewish law. 
It's to create a cathedral in time, a day of rest. It's a time in which you reconnect to creation. It's a time in which you reconnect to God and the Torah. The Gregorian calendar does not respect Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as the day of rest. And in order to become part of a greater society, Jews in many ways were being forced to give up this very important part of religious life so that they could become part of a greater society. The meaning of Sabbath, he writes, is to celebrate time rather than space. Six days a week we live under the tyranny of things of space. On the Sabbath, we try to become attuned to holiness in time. And my mother and I would light the candles, kindle the lights, and say the blessings, and my father would bless me. And then we would go into the living room. The living room had windows facing the Hudson River. And we would sit there and watch as the sun gradually would set over the Hudson River. And the view was beautiful and it was peaceful. And I will tell you that from the time I was a child, when I lit those candles, I felt transformed. His articulation helped us see that Sabbath is intensely Jewish, but then it's not Jewish at all, it's human. The Sabbath is followed by a work that dares to reimagine the very relationship between God and humanity, God in search of man. This notion of divine pathos, what does it really mean to acknowledge that God needs us in the way we need God and our calling is to be a partner with God to engage in tikkun alum, this amending of the world, repairing the damages of the world, transforming the world in light of the hurt, the pain, the misery, the suffering. What is the meaning of man? To be a mind of God. God is invisible. Since he couldn't be everywhere, he created man. You look at man and you are reminded of God. As God is compassionate, let men be compassionate. As God strives for meaning and justice, let men strive for meaning and justice. The conventional popular religion uh, always wants to imagine that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, all the big absolutes. And Heschel saw that that is a complete misrepresentation of the biblical tradition because the biblical tradition wants to portray God as so passionate for justice and so committed to love that God is willing to enter into the suffering of the world and by God's presence to transform that suffering. The core theological commitment that Heschel carried is not just that God needs people, but rather that God has chosen to need people. God does not want to be the only actor in the world. God doesn't want to redeem the world alone. God wants partners. God wants covenant partners. In Heschel's theology, God takes an enormous gamble. If God relies on people, God can be sorely, devastatingly disappointed. That's how the prophets talk. And in 1962, as the civil rights movement is gaining urgency across America, Heschel chooses this moment to revise and translate into English his earlier dissertation on the prophets. This is the version that will inspire many of the civil rights leaders. Every preacher there knew who he was, and uh, Dr. King's copy was all underlined. It was almost as though he had memorized a lot of it. At the center of his great book on the prophets is his study of the prophet Jeremiah. And more than any other prophet in the Hebrew Bible, Jeremiah dares to give voice to what it was like to be face to face with God. In 1962, Pope John XXIII summons leaders of the Catholic Church to Rome. Over the next four years, the Church will wrestle with issues intended to more closely connect the Church with the modern world. One of the most challenging issues is how the Church will address its relationship with other faiths, in particular, a thousand year history, what some have called a teaching of contempt toward the Jews. 
there were bishops who carried some of the old stereotypes and misunderstandings, caricatures of Judaism that had developed over the ages. The Pope assigns Cardinal August Bayer, a German biblical scholar, to prepare a study. It promises to be the most contested document the council will produce. Cardinal Bayer was a German cardinal who had lived through World War I, the rise of Nazism, the Holocaust, and there was suspicion of him in the Jewish community because he was a, a German, a German cardinal. The American Jewish Committee is invited to consult with the council on the document. Mark Tannenbaum heads the AJC delegation. Here's Tannenbaum who sees that there's a tremendous historical opportunity to get the Catholic Church to rewrite its teachings about Judaism. And who better than Abraham Joshua Heschel to carry on this dialogue? Because Heschel is totally learned, totally authentic, totally a part of the Jewish community. His Jewish credentials cannot be questioned. And yet, here's Heschel, who's convinced with every fiber of his being that God loves other people and not just Jews. It was clear very quickly that Heschel and Bea developed a very good rapport. They were both senior scholars. They had read each other's work. My father wanted a repudiation of any effort to convert the Jews. That was extremely important to him. He wanted a rejection of anti-Semitism, of course, but he also wanted something positive. He wanted the church to have institutions that would foster an understanding of Judaism and working together. The council members will now convene in Rome every fall as committees advance the various documents throughout the year. Back in the United States, Heschel is invited to speak at a groundbreaking conference on religion and race that brings together religious leaders from across America. Here he meets Martin Luther King Jr. for the first time. I think that when Heschel met King in 1963 at that conference on religion and race and they got to talking, he recognized not just a kindred soul, but a kindred biography. Like, here you have the son and grandson of Hasidic rabbis and the son and grandson of black Baptist preachers. We have Heschel saying about the civil rights movement that it was easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than it is for a Negro, he called it, a Negro to walk across some campuses in the South. That Chicago gathering prompts President John Kennedy to bring the Religion and Race Conference to the White House in the hopes it might derail a planned summer march on Washington. My father was invited to that and uh, responded with a marvelous telegram that ends with the phrase, I propose that you, Mr. President, declare a state of moral emergency. The hour calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. When Heschel talked about racism as Satanism and sent those historic telegrams to John F. Kennedy and said that we humiliate Negroes, we forfeit the right to worship, one of the most precious rights, freedom of expression. If you're treating black people like this, then in fact, you are forfeiting your own right to worship. In Rome, the summer of 1963 brings the death of Pope John. His successor is Pope Paul VI, who recommits to the work of the Council. The Committee on the Catholic Jewish Document is working through various drafts, but there is a problem. When the second draft appeared, it called for a hope for the eventual conversion of the Jews. My father was very upset about that, and he called it spiritual fratricide. One of the biggest scandals in the history of the Church was to try to make Christians out of Jews. Now, Christianity is a religion for which I have very great respect. I have great reverence for many Christians, but I also have to remind them that my being Jewish is so sacred to me that I am ready to die for it. And when a statement came out from the Ecumenical Council expressing the hope that the Jews would eventually join the church, I came out with a very strong rebuke. I'd say I'd rather go to Auschwitz and give up my religion. With the document now in question, it's arranged for Heschel to fly to Rome and plead directly with the Pope. While my father was attacked, of course, before the document ever even came out, there were some who said, you shouldn't talk to them. I remember somebody in a Jewish newspaper 
a letter to the editor that said, if Rabbi Heschel wants to talk to the Pope, let the Pope come to him. Why should, why should we as Jews go to the... And my father said, if what I'm doing will save one life, of course I'll go to Rome. The Pope meets with Heschel, but will not commit to changing the language of the document himself. Instead, he prefers to leave it to the Council. They had a several days debate about precisely this document, sometimes called the Great Debate. The thousand or so bishops actually got up and one after the other they spoke. And virtually all those who spoke, spoke out in favor of a strong document, condemning anti-Semitism and going back to the earlier document. And that had uh, distanced itself from, from an agenda of conversion. And that, I think they had Rabbi Heschel's uh, words ringing in their ears. In the fall of 1965, after four years of intense debate, the final document is passed by a wide margin. It's called Nostra Etate, Latin for In Our Time. It called for mutual respect and understanding between the Roman Catholic Church and the Jewish people. It denounced anti-Semitism in all its forms. It called for a fraternal dialogue between Jews and Catholics and repudiated the concept of Jews as the killers of Jesus of Nazareth. And there is no call for the conversion of the Jews. That was a tremendous moment in religious history. Heschel played a clandestine role because there were a lot of Jews that didn't want to have anything to do with what the Christians were doing, and a lot of Jews who thought that it was dangerous. Now lauded for his pioneering interfaith work, that fall, Heschel is invited to be a visiting professor at the Protestant-founded Union Theological Seminary, across the street from his own JTS. He became the first non-Christian to be invited to join the faculty. They had to change the bylaws a bit for that. And he gave this wonderful lecture, opening lecture on November 10th, 1965, called No Religion is an Island. On what basis do we people of different religious commitments meet one another? First and foremost, we meet as human beings. To meet a human being is an opportunity to sense the image of God, the presence of God. The Lord said to Moses, wherever you see the trace of man, there I stand before you. He came to think that religious diversity was God's will that God wanted to be worshiped in a variety of ways, in a range of ways, in different languages, in different religious, you know, images. That Heschel understood when Amos talked about let justice roll down like waters, that was not just for Israel, that was for nations all around the world. It emerged out of Israel, but it had a universal vision. Vietnam, the war will span three decades and tear at the very heart of the nation. Many view America's intervention as a way to thwart communist expansion. Yet the more troops and funds committed, the more the anti-war movement grows. My father was not a pacifist. And he was not a communist sympathizer by any means. But killing civilians, that was unacceptable. What does God demand of us primarily? justice and compassion. What does he condemn above all? Murder, killing innocent people. How can I pray when I have in my conscience the awareness that I am co-responsible for the death of innocent people in Vietnam? Heschel becomes co-chairman of a nationwide effort with over 50,000 clergy and laypersons calling for an end to the war. One of the things he said to me that has never left me, that if you're the heir to a great religious tradition, it's your responsibility, it's your duty, not just your right, it's your duty to speak in the name of that tradition as best you can. And the most important religious issue of our time is to end the war in Vietnam. In April 1967, a major event is scheduled at New York's Riverside Church, nearby Jewish Theological Seminary. The keynote speaker is Martin Luther King Jr. At Heschel's urging, King will deliver a much-anticipated statement against the war. I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken. 
I speak as one who loves America, to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop it must be ours. There were people within SCLC, within Dr. King's organization, on the board, saying you cannot mix your concern with ending the war in Vietnam but with civil ranks. You could lose your influence. Vietnam, he thought, was completely unjustifiable, and he knew that King had leverage in America in a way that he would never have. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And it electrified the audience that was there and was immediately denounced by everybody across the country, the New York Times, the Washington Post. What's he talking about? War. He should stick to civil rights. He doesn't know anything about it. He, he's lost his moral standing for sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. That same night, Heschel adds his own plea. We are assembled here because our own integrity as human beings is decaying. The blood we shed in Vietnam makes a mockery of all our proclamations, dedications, commitments, and celebrations. No triumph is worth the price of the terror which we commit in that land. People came to see my father from the Israeli embassy and said, you should be quiet about Vietnam. You'll endanger US support for Israel. Be quiet. My father wouldn't be quiet. No one could silence him. It's not simply that one takes a position that you disagree with. If it's one that is so deeply unpopular, like going against the Vietnam War, people then use that as the lens to interpret your theological work, your philosophical work, your teaching, all as a means to this unjust end, that he's putting at risk his life's work to do the right thing. The moral substance of America is at stake. Remember, in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. My father had a heart condition and his health was fragile. I knew it from childhood, and I was frightened. During the next months, King and Heschel remain close. Often, it's the war that brings them together. Exactly one year to the day after the Riverside speech, King will be assassinated. Dr. King had come just 10 days before to speak at a gathering honoring my father, a convention of conservative rabbis in the Catskills at a hotel, the Concord Hotel. And when Dr. King came that night and walked into the auditorium, we all stood up and we crossed arms and held hands, and we sang, We Shall Overcome in Hebrew. In 1969, the 62-year-old Heschel suffers a life-threatening heart attack and is hospitalized for three months. But once he recovers, he returns to his teaching and advocacy work. In particular, he campaigns to raise awareness for the plight of Jews in the Soviet Union. Look, a Jew in Russia who is oppressed we here are also hurt. To feel it deeply, to feel it all the time, is our task. The Soviet Jewry movement was really important to him because Heschel was a Jew who wanted to struggle for the dignity of Jews. He wanted to make sure that the way that Jews were indifferent, or many Jews were indifferent while World War II was going on, they would not be indifferent in the face of Soviet Jewry. For us to be silent, is the crime of indifference, the crime of silence. The Jews in Soviet Russia cannot cry out. It is our task to be their voice, to be their cry. I was home that Friday. We had a Shabbat dinner with guests, and uh, my father was exhausted. And then we all went to sleep 
And the next morning, my mother woke me up screaming that my father had died, that he couldn't wake up. She couldn't wake him. People say in Jewish tradition that to die in your sleep, especially on the Sabbath, is a kiss from God. Abraham Joshua Heschel dies December 1972 at the age of 65. Over his lifetime, he forged a new path for modern Judaism that honored the piety and traditions of his faith as he confronted the great injustices of his day. His commitment to embody the covenant between God and humanity to renew the world remains an inspiration for Jews and non-Jews alike. If there's one word that would cover Abraham Heschel, it was passion. He never doubted the truth and the reality of God's holiness. So whereas I don't think he ever thought of himself as a prophet, he became a prophet for everyone else. Most synagogues have his picture up on their walls, even when their leadership 40, 50 years ago took real issue with some of Heschel's political leanings. The sentence that I think he writes more than any other over the course of his writing is a very simple sentence. Something is asked of us. When he talks about wonder and awe and radical amazement, it's as if suddenly we discover, yes, there are other dimensions to my life as a human being that I, I can explore. In this day and age, I think that if you ask young, committed Jews who the most important Jew of the 20th century was for them, it would undoubtedly be Abraham Joshua Heschel. Even in the midst of European Jewry burning to the ground, he had the audacity to remind us of the great dream of thousands of years, the dream of a world redeemed. to absorb, a lot to reflect upon, and uh, that's what we hope to uh, accomplish during the next 45 minutes or so. But before we move on to the conversation uh, segment of our program this evening, um, I'd like once again to thank Chris Koble, the Senior Vice President for Religion of the Lilly Endowment, for extending this invitation to Beth El Tzedek and to the Jewish Community Center. Uh, the invitation that has made this evening's event possible. Uh, I'd like to thank also Reverend Brian Williams of the endowment for the very fruitful contributions to the conversation that brought us to this evening's program. As always, it is a pleasure for Sandy and me to work with our dear friend and congregant Lev Rothenberg of the Jewish Community Center and to support the Ann Katz Festival of Books. I'd like to acknowledge also uh, Jackie Goldstein. Jackie Goldstein is the communications director of Congregation Beth El Tzedek, and she has kept us connected uh, this evening and for so many other programs uh, in these past two years when we, when we have learned to live virtually. Uh, of course, tonight we are learning to live virtuously. Uh, the documentary we have just uh, seen this evening is the result of the vision and the talent of Martin Dobelmeyer, whom it is my pleasure to introduce. He and Susanna Heschel, who will be introduced soon by Sandy, will serve as our panel of experts in further exploring spiritual, spiritual audacity, the Abraham Joshua Heschel story to which we have been treated. Uh, Martin is the founder and president of Journey Fil Films in Alexandria, Virginia. He is a film and television producer, uh, owns a company with a focus on religion, faith, and spirituality. Uh, he has degrees in religious studies, broadcast journalism, and honorary degrees in fine arts. 
Martin has produced more than 30 award-winning documentary films, including Bonhoeffer, about the theologian and Nazi, Nazi resistor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, also The Power of Forgiveness. More recently, biographies of Reinhold Niebuhr, Howard Thurman, Dorothy Day. And now, Abraham Joshua Heschel, which recently won the Wilbur Award for Best Documentary. It has been a pleasure for Sandy and for me to get to know Martin in preparation for this evening's Indianapolis premiere of Spiritual Audacity. We thank you, Martin, for this very special gift. Thanks for being with us. Well, thanks. It's a joy to be with you. I'm sorry that we have to do it virtually. When we started talking about this now months ago, the plan was that we would come out, uh, Susanna and I would be out in Indianapolis for this. We'd enjoy Indianapolis for a day or two and all be together under the same roof, but that didn't really work out, the best laid plans. But uh, I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to share. It looked like you had a good audience come out for the film tonight, Wonderful. so I'm really happy about Great that. Attendance. And uh, it's deserving so. I mean, uh, Abraham Heschel really is one of the most important religious figures in, in the 20th century. And not just a religious figure, he's really a great American figure. He's a tour de force when it comes to taking the wisdom of the ancients and putting it together um, in combating the social and political issues of his day. And the way that he did it, the eloquence with which he spoke, left so much behind for all of us to continue to think about. I mean, he's combating racism. We still live with the, with the legacy of racism. Um, I was reading again uh, his talk about religion and race, the whole notion that racism is the maximum amount of, maximum amount of hatred for the minimum amount of reason. These are, these are lines that'll stay with us throughout the ages. I mean, this is, it sums up exactly what it is we're confronting when we think about how are we as black and white gonna be able to live together uh, and build a common, a, a beloved community. So for me, Heschel offers so much, not only to appreciate what happened in the past, because I know that uh, in the 21st century, there's a sense that no one can really speak to us out of the past. We have our own issues right now. We think it's all unique. Uh, but the truth of the matter is the, the moment you take time to look at it carefully and realize that it really is a repetition of the same kind of human behavior, we have to look to the great spiritual masters. And I think Heschel is one of those people who, who continues to speak to us today. And you have made him come alive for us. Thank you so much. Well, it was easy. And I have to say it was a lot of that was because of Susanna. I had done this film on uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, right, Susanna? And I asked Susanna if she would want to be part of that film on Reinhold Niebuhr, the great American public theologian that we talked about in, in this film. But in addition to uh, the friendship, these, these two men had a professional engagement, but also a personal relationship, a personal friendship that was the embodiment of this notion of of inter interfaith connectedness, two great figures, intellectual figures who found a home in each other and a trust within each other. And they would take these long walks uh, up and back of Union Theological Seminary together and talk about every, all the big issues that were facing the country at the time, theologically and politically and socially. And I asked her if she would be part of that film and she, and she graciously said yes, and she was a great part of that film. And that's when the conversation started about doing a film about her father. I, so I feel, her giving me the chance to do that is like a sacred trust. I mean, this, this is her father. And uh, I, I, I felt every day that I was given a responsibility. I just come at it to do the very best I possibly can. Well, I'd like to take this moment to also introduce Susanna Heschel. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me. So the book, uh, Susanna, that you published in 1983 on being a Jewish feminist is sitting in my library with lots of underlinings. You said that it was audacious to write such a book and boy, do I know that and I'm very grateful. It was that collection of essays and uh, Susanna's work on Christian uh, feminist anti-Semitism that have been really important uh, sources of scholarship for me and a generation. And uh, if all of you listening, you have probably been influenced by Su Susanna Heschel and don't know it. If you have an orange on your Seder plate, thank Susanna Heschel for that. And you can ask for more about that. Um, 
along with Susanna's books, I have all of uh, Abraham Joshua Hesriel's books in another part of the library also underlined. So let me just say a little more about Susanna. She is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Dartmouth College. She teaches courses ranging from Jewish history and culture to seminars on Arabs, Jews, and modernity, Jewish views of Christianity, and modern Jewish thought. Her research has spanned a range of topics, including her book on 19th century German Jewish historian Abraham Geiger, and her study of Protestant theologians in Nazi Germany, and her publications on Jewish scholarship on Islam. Amazing. Her first forthcoming book is co-authored with Sarah Imhoff entitled Jewish Studies and the Woman Question. And I'm really uh, looking forward to being able to read that. So now I would like to invite Susanna to share a few thoughts and then perhaps the two of you can share some uh, conversation together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandy, for that lovely introduction. And I also wish I could be there in person in Indianapolis. Uh, but I, I, I want to say how grateful I am to Martin for making this film. Martin first found some extraordinary film footage and sound of my father that we didn't know existed. But he also, most important, presented my father in the context that means so much, it would have meant so much to my father, but he, Martin understood the many facets of my father's life, his own religious Jewish life, his engagement with the Second Vatican Council and with Catholic and Protestant theologians such as Reinhold Niebuhr, and of course his work in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the free Soviet Jewry movement, his trips to Israel and his lectures to the World Zionist Organization. There were so many different components to my father's life. He was so active. And at the same time, he wrote such extraordinary books that inspire us to this day. And I, I have to say, it's, um, it's wonderful to hear my father's voice in this film, Martin, and to hear your voice with my father's voice, because I do have the immediate sense that you understood him, you do understand him in a way that not everybody does. So I'm very grateful. I know that this is a film that will be shown for decades and generations to come. And it's a, it's a marvelous tribute. And it's also a wonderful archive of my father's life. So I thank you. There's so much that we could talk about regarding my father and also the making of the film. Uh, so one of the things that I imagine would be difficult, you are a filmmaker, Martin, who has looked at theologians uh, and the theologians that you selected are all people who were active politically and socially and who also wrote books. And I wonder, as a filmmaker, if it's difficult for you to balance the active engagement in society on the one hand with the ideas of the book, uh, I, I imagine to, to take arguments from a book, ideas from a book, and to present them in a film, that must be a challenge. I think you did a wonderful job presenting my father's ideas. But I think as a filmmaker, that must be difficult. Well, it's, it is, it's part of the, it's the challenge. I mean, ultimately uh, you just, uh, I mean, the process for me is the same. It's been the same for the last 30 plus years. You, you just dive into it. You gather everything you can, talk to everybody you possibly can, listen as best as you can. I think what I try hard with every film is to listen. Uh, as best as I can. And I, I have to say what I've learned over the years, and maybe your father's contributed to this, is that I think you can, uh, you can actually gauge your spiritual health by how well you're listening. Uh, I've noticed that at times when I'm sort of off-centered and I'm not quite sure what's going on, I'm not really listening very well. And so before I go into a film project, I always try to take a little time and, sort of, you know, pray and think about it and cleanse myself as best as I can and just open up myself to be able to really listen. That's the starting place for all of it. So I read everything I possibly can and then I start talking to people and 
uh, we, we made the decision um, that we would not, uh, with any of these films, the film before this was Dorothy Day and before that Howard Thurman and before that Reinhold Niebuhr, that we would never um, contextualize the film in a contemporary moment. People can draw out of the film what they can uh, against the contemporary environment. Uh, but we didn't say, well, Heschel would say this about today. I thought the best thing to do was to make the film stay in the historic moment and let this conversation happen now. And in five years, it may be a very different conversation to look at Heschel. Uh, and so that's, that's why we make the decision to sort of stay in that historic moment and just tell the story as best as we can. But you helped a lot. You had uh, a lot of your own photographs of your family and your father and many of those were your photographs. And I thought you did a great interview. I have to say, we really worked you, if I can use that language. I mean, we, we sat you down, we went for a couple of hours and uh, you, I thought you were as strong at the end of the interview as you were at the, at the at this outset. So you, I know you've told the story many times, but you told it with gusto and imagination and as if it was the first time. So believe me, if the film is good, it's in large part because you did a great job. And the corollary to uh, the question that you have both raised. Susanna, do you want to respond to that? I just want to say thank you. That's very generous of you, Martin. Go ahead. Uh, a, a corollary to the issue that you have both raised, uh, uh, I think hinges on that uh, comment that your uh, father, uh, Rabbi Heschel, made, uh, I think, uh, uh, as an appeal to President Kennedy. He asked him to call a state of moral emergency. Um, because the hour called for spiritual audacity. Uh, what would you, Susanna, consider um, to, to be the state of spiritual emergency uh, at which we live in these days? How would your father respond to, to, to that moral emergency? What is it and what would he say? So, there are so many things that my father was deeply concerned about in his life that remain with us today. Poverty, racism, corruption, the mendacity of the government that he used to speak about. These are still problems with us today. He was deeply concerned about these issues, about poverty, about the violence committed in our name by our government, then in Vietnam and Cambodia. He was so concerned that it was difficult for him at times to sleep, to focus on his work. He was overwhelmed by the troubles of the world and by the suffering Martin showed photographs from Vietnam. It was, my father was horrified by the way the war had simply become a war crime. He was also concerned about the failure of people to speak up. I just might add that there were some people who would ask my father, should I burn my draft card? Or should I join the Freedom Riders and go south? Very dangerous. My father would never tell them what to do. He felt that we have to make our own decisions. My father made his decisions. And one of the challenges was whether he should go to prison during the war in Vietnam as an act of protest. But he felt that our acts of protest should not be symbolic, how I might sacrifice myself but rather that we need to have a goal, a strategic goal, and be thoughtful in trying to reach that goal. If we want to bring an end to the war in Vietnam, we want to convince people that it's wrong, that it's, that it's a terrible thing to have simply carpet bombing, to drop napalm on civilians, that this is not a war. Talk to people, convince them. We've become so polarized these days and there is such terrible corruption that we see over and over that horrified my father and of course that came for him from jewish tradition from the prophets onward the biblical prophets who also talk about the disavowal of our own corruption of our own sin jeremiah says 
you have blood on your shirt and you still say, I am innocent. That, that corruption, that disavow was of great concern to my father. And so I would say that we can see quite clearly what we need to do today. It's very clear. Yeah, can I uh, follow that up uh, with another question? There is something unique about your dad and Martin, you can speak to this as well, uh, that he focused on universal issues and spoke to the world, right? And at the same time, he was very, uh, took great pride and advocated for Jewish causes. And I, I'm just curious, of, you know, how would you uh, speak about that sort of unique um, position of holding close your own heritage and identity and also speaking to the world? Because that, that is an issue that sometimes we confront today. So I don't know who wants to take that, but. Um... I think it's what you said is just so true. My father was expected is from childhood that he would become a Hasidic Rebbe. And he used to say, no, that he felt that the world needed something from him and that he had a, a mandate from heaven that he needed to speak to the world with the teachings of Judaism, with what we stand for as Jews, including his Hasidic heritage. You know, I was just reading in a, in a Hasidic text to the Meyashiloach by the Ishbitzer, Mordechai Leiner from the 19th century, and he talks about chapter 19 of the book of numbers about the paraduma the red heifer and he changes it all around what is it to be impure what is the ritual impurity he says you know it's it's resentment it's resentment over things that have happened that are over and finished that we can't get rid of and to be in that state of resentment it's like being dead he says and just had such a marvelous echo. I know my father had read that passage because I have his copy and he marked it. Uh, and yes, these are teachings that are from Hasidism, which is in some ways the most isolated and introverted Jewish movement we can think of. But on the other hand, this is a great human teaching for all of us. And one that I think is very important today because there's so much of a mood of, of resentment and grievance and anger around in this country and in many other countries as well. And I actually feel that my father's books are the antidote to that. They're an antidote to resentment, an antidote to the kind of grievance that locks us up in our lives. It, like the Hasidic Sefer said, is that it's as if you're dead when you're just angry. So, I was going to say that um, on one of the lines, I, I, I watched the film tonight again, and I always make a purpose of uh, trying to look for something that I hadn't really thought on enough. It's like reading a passage from the sacred text and saying one more time, can you find something else that uh, sort of sparks it? And I was thinking that uh, there's, a, there's a line from, uh, uh, from Ben Sachs, who's not far, he's in Baltimore, and, he, and he's at the um, Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies here. He's just a brilliant scholar. And uh, he said that when Abraham Heschel came over from, from Europe in 1940, he winds up in Cincinnati. He's taking only observations about what's happening at the seminary in Cincinnati, but about American culture. And he calls American, he, at the time, he called American culture vapid. Uh, and I thought, boy, if you arrived here today, what would he think? I mean, if he thought 1940 was vapid, what would he think about what's going on in America today? And, and the truth of the matter is, I think he would, uh, he would, uh, he, he would attack nihilism and the concerns about meaninglessness of life. I think he, I, I think he would embody a sense of connectedness to God. Uh, I, I think that's the thing that really sparks me. I think to read Heschel gives you a window on how God sees us. It's always us seeing God, but he, he presents to us this window about how, how God might be looking at us. And isn't that the prophet? Isn't that what the prophet does? Uh, Rabbi Dennis, you had given me the script, the script from the interview that he did, the last interview he did on television, 1972, with Carl Stern, who obviously was a great admirer of, of Abraham Heschel. And uh, he, he, after he sort of talked, introduced the book, The Prophets, and there was a little conversation about The Prophets, Stern turns to your father and says, do you consider yourself a prophet? 
And, he, and Abraham Heschel says, no, but I consider myself a descendant of the prophets. And, and I think that's the avenue that all of us have to see is available to us. We can hold Heschel high, and we should. Uh, but the truth of the matter is not high, but not distant. The truth of the matter is, I think what Heschel does is say that with study, seriousness, and an openness to God calling you, we all have to assume the responsibility of in some way, shape, or form being a descendant of the prophets and to stand true to that. I mean, that's exactly what your father did every single day. When you say that he couldn't sleep at night, he was disturbed. Isn't that the behavior of the prophets? I mean, if you're not disturbed about what's going on, you're not paying attention. He was paying attention and like a prophet should, he was on alert, he was disturbed by all of that. And he brought that disturbance into the public square in an articulate and intelligent way. And I think that's why we remember him now 50 years later. And that's where the element of pathos, pathos, right, comes in. And uh, one way in which that was articulated that continues to be of significance is in uh, Rabbi Heschel's um, interfaith conversation, particularly with the Catholic Church that led to the proclamation of Nostra Etate, which was an important ingredient that led to that. Um, Another uh, beloved uh, deceased friend of ours was Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, who was very involved in the prophet in the process, and who in fact was in in some ways the uh, the shidduch maker who brought Rabbi Heschel to the forefront of this conversation. Um, could you comment a little bit, either Susanna or Martin, on how you see the impetus? Uh, that uh, Rabbi Heschel gave to, to that movement in the 1960s, uh, reverberating today. Susanna, you teach this uh, as part of your academic uh, engagement. And uh, Martin, as a uh, um, filmmaker, you have interviewed uh, prominent uh, Christian teachers. Where, where does, what was the unique contribution of Heschel to the interfaith movement uh, that we can continue to build upon today? Well, there, there are many things that, <laughs> many ways to answer. I'll just make a few comments and then uh, Martin uh, will continue. I, I, first of all, my father's engagement with Christian theology goes back to his student days in Berlin. He was at the University of Berlin starting in 1927. And he studied Christian theology, Protestant Reformation and the work of biblical, uh, biblical scholars, Protestants. And he knew, he knew their arguments and responded to them very critically in his doctoral dissertation on the prophets. Um, but uh, he also was brought together with Cardinal Bea in part by Mark Tannenbaum in the American Jewish Committee. And Cardinal Bea, who was in charge of Nostra Aetate, had studied also at the University of Berlin, including with some of the same professors that my father studied with, though earlier, Bea was much older. And that one of those professors was Eugen Mitvach, someone my father was very close to, a Jewish professor. So that was a bond. Uh, my father also brought Cardinal Bea a copy of the Midrash on the Shir Shirim on the Song of Songs uh, as a gift, special edition. Um, so there are ways in which they were able to establish a relationship together, the two my father and Cardinal Bea, it was of grave importance for the Second Vatican Council and the formulation of this document. And Cardinal Bea was really a heroic figure, but I'll mention one other thing about Cardinal Bea. He had published early on a book in which he said, when God makes a covenant, a promise, God doesn't say, oh, I've changed my mind and I'm discounting that promise, that covenant. On the contrary, when God makes a covenant, it's forever. And therefore, Bea wrote, the covenant with the Jews, the Old Testament, is forever. It was a very strong thing for a Christian thinker to say in the first half of the 20th century. But there's one other thing that I think is important. So my father's contribution, in a sense, goes back um, perhaps to Jacob Emden, the 18th century European Orthodox rabbi, who was amazingly positive about Christianity in extraordinary ways, far more than what you find even among 19th and 20th century liberal rabbis and theologians. 
My father was very much in that tradition, appreciating what Christianity does for Jews, its contributions to religiosity. My father said, no, religion is an island because if Jews live in a community, in an area where Christians are pious, Jews are also pious. And if the Christians are not pious, it affects the Jews as well. We affect one another. And it's that word, affect, that is also important in understanding this. That is, it's also about the relationships, the emotions, the affect. My father had relationships with Christian theologians. As you mentioned with Reinhold Niebuhr, they didn't just exchange ideas or read each other's books. They were personal friends. And that was something very new in the history of Jewish Christian relations, that they were personal friends. They laughed together, they talked together. The very idea that Reinhold Niebuhr, the greatest Protestant theologian in America in the 20th century, asked a Jew to deliver the eulogy at his funeral. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary in the history of the last 2000 years. But I think it was also deeply moving to Christians to meet my father. It was moving to their hearts. It wasn't just a matter of changing their theological views of Judaism. They were moved to meet him and to be in the presence of a Jew who was so pious and so gentle and so learned and who prayed with them. That was very important and very special and something that was for the priests and the nuns who came to our home for Shabbat or for Passover Seder. This was radically new and extraordinary and deeply moving to them. So that too is an important element. I was going to add, I think, I think Reinhold Niebuhr invited your father to say the eulogy because he just wanted a good eulogy. He wanted to make sure he was going to get a really good eulogy when he died. And that, and, I, and your father did, he delivered on the promise. They came together and did that. I think the sad thing, and I think in some ways the triumphant thing about a Abraham Heschel was that this is the early 1960s, the scar, the, what, what had happened during the Holocaust was still on everybody's mind at the time. This is part of what the Catholic Church was trying to figure out. How is it going to claim its role and rewrite, maybe even rewrite its own history for its involvement or lack of involvement in what should have been happening in Germany in the 1930s with the rise of Hitler. And uh, the loss of your, of, your, um, of your grandmother, Abraham Heschel's mother and his three sisters, the personal tragedy that was experienced in the family the knowledge of all that had happened and how the churches, the Catholic church in particular, did not step up and, and risk itself really in any way. The Concordat that the Catholic church signed in 1933, saying that there's gonna be peace between, uh, between the Catholic church in Germany and, uh, and, uh, and the German government, which was, I think, a, a tragedy that happened. And yet your father, when invited to come in and sit down and help guide the church, the Catholic church, into making this monumental document, was able to put all of that aside, not dwell in the anger and the hatred and the resentment that he could have easily borne and found a way forward. And I think the, it became really an historic document. It's the most important document I think that came out of, of, no, of the Second Vatican Council and it continues to reverberate now, so many years afterwards. And your father was a key part of that. Yes. So Senator, can I ask a, another question you mentioned about how, you know, so many people came to your home to be, to be with your dad and you also talked about lighting Sabbath candles with your mom and the family and what that all meant to you. Can you say something about what it was like growing up in your household uh, and how that may have influenced your decision in terms of your career and your scholarship? Well, let's see, <laughs> there's so much to say, but I, uh, first, I'm an only child and my parents took me with them wherever they went. Uh, and so I used to go and listen to my father lecture frequently and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and um, at home, we, um, there was a lot of 
playfulness. What can I say? My father as a child only read books and studied. And so I think he really enjoyed having a child and being a father and playing games with me. And he, in reading stories to me and telling me stories, my bedtime stories were really Hasidic stories or stories from Midrash, from commentaries to the Bible. Uh, when I finally went to elementary school, I, I found studying the Bible, I already knew <laughs> I was, I was supposed to learn because it was so much a part of, of my home. And at the same time, my parents' friends were all European Jewish refugee scholars, and they talked about Europe all the time and what had been so great in German literature and poetry and philosophy. I knew the names of all the German philosophers because that was the table talk. Um, and I felt sometimes a bit like a a tourist in America. Uh, I um, I always wanted to go to Howard Johnson's because I thought that was really like America. <laughs> and I told my father he should learn to play golf like American fathers, <laughs> which was the last thing in the world. He had no idea what that was. Uh, my parents I very rarely went out. My mother went to concerts. Sometimes my father would go with her. Occasionally they would go to the theater I think they went to a movie twice in 25 years uh, and because they, my mother was always playing the piano and my father was always studying, always, uh, and there were books everywhere. So it, it was, it just seemed that to do that, to live with books, to be studying all the time was the way one lives. Uh, and. So that's how I live too. I'm just, uh, yeah. I have one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Lev perhaps to share with us uh, some questions uh, from the uh, participants in the Q&A. Uh, Sandy and I had the opportunity of meeting your father. Uh, he was actually a speaker at Congregation Beth El Tzedek, of course, before we came. We came here in 1977. So one of the first things that I found among the memorabilia of the congregation were pictures of Rabbi Heschel's, uh, when he spoke at the congregation Beth El Tzedek. But we met him at an event uh, honoring uh, uh, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, who, you know, uh, is the, um, the founder of the Reconstructionist Movement and uh, in many ways, uh, a spiritual mentor of ours. And, uh, he and your father were two pillar figures at the Jewish Theological uh, Seminary uh, with very different perspectives on Judaism. Uh, is there any little insight that you can share with us about your dad and Rabbi Kaplan? Yes, I th first of all, it's clear Rabbi Kaplan wrote about my father in his diaries that Mel Skult has published. Right. And he wrote with great warmth. He was reading some of my father's first English language publications articles, including one article called An Analysis of Piety. And Kaplan loved it and was one of the people who was pushing the seminary to hire my father. This is still in the 1940s. Uh, and yes, they remained friends, although they, they had different approaches. Yes, Kaplan was miserable at the seminary and my father was miserable at the seminary also. <laughs> <laughs> but but they were friends. We visited the Kaplans at their home, um, and my father invited Rabbi and Mrs. Kaplan to uh, to my bat mitzvah, and uh, he wrote a lovely note in which he said he hoped that I would grow up to be a good Jewess. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so yes, they had a good relationship. I I don't know if you were at that dinner honoring Mordechai Kaplan's yes, 90th where, birthday. Yes, he's here in Waldorf. I was there also. Yes, there we were. There. Yes, uh, and my father was very it, funny that evening. In fact, I found the program for that recently. Uh, and um, Sandy and I are listed in the program as, as uh, students at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Long yeah. Uh, Can I ask one quick question yeah. about the film? This is more in terms of how you choose certain things. So you, uh, you also had to decide what clips to, shoot, to choose, film clips, but you also picked up some art. Uh, I know some Chagall, I don't know all of what you picked. How do you 
decide on that and what determines how you integrate that into the film? Well, um, that, that's a great question. You can, you can imagine, and, and one of the first production moments, the team, we all get together and sit around the table and talk about how we're going to do this. And as much as, well, as much as we love, the, we want to talk about that, we want to talk about the prophets of the Old Testament. It's a core theme for Abraham Joshua Heschel. Everybody looked at each other and said, how the heck are we going to show this? What are we going to do? This is going to be, it can be, it can be a saccharine. It can be reenacted. It can be just, it can, it can really, how we portray the prophets could sink the film in, in a lot of people's eyes. And I, I thought, you know, maybe we should be realistic here. We can't use the images um, out of the Christian Renaissance. There are plenty of images of Jeremiah in churches and cathedrals all over Europe, but these are all depictions that were created mostly by the Catholic Church. And I thought that would, that would, <laughs> that would not go well. Uh, and I, uh, frankly, they weren't my favorite. But then I, I actually, I have a small collection of books about Marc Chagall, and it just dawned on me, if I could get them to agree to uh, let us use some of these characters, and they were talking specifically about Jeremiah, and here's Chagall's images of Jeremiah, and I thought, you know, this, this, can, this can work, and let's, let's try and keep working on this, because it seems thematically right and appropriate. Uh, he was, you know, he's a Russian Jew who emigrated Here's, you know, here's Heschel, who, was an who had emigrated out, out of Europe and come to the United States. So thematically and texturally, I thought it worked well. And, that's, yes. and that, got us, <laughs> that got us out of it. So uh, that, that's how we think. And that's always the challenge, because it's one thing to write a book about it. But when you have to actually put it up on a television screen, all new challenges come to bear. Beautifully done. Yes. Well, Lev, do we have some uh, questions uh, to, to share? We have a question. Now, I would like, first of all, I would like to thank all four of you for the, the wisdom, both in the questions and in the answers. It was absolutely intriguing and wonderful. Now is the time when our audience can ask questions. Some people have been raising their hand, and uh, in fact, there's some people raising their hand right now. I apologize. We cannot respond to hands being raised. Some people have put some things, uh, I think, in the chat. We can't respond to that. We respond to Q&A. So please, if you have a question, type it in to the Q&A tab, and I will gladly look over it. Now, the question that we do have at this point is it's rather theological, and I will open it up to whomever is going to uh, answer. It says, what is the difference between the Catholic and the Jewish view of original sin? And did Rabbi Heschel ever speak to this? Susanna, I think that's yours. I can't recall any uh, really original sin. Want to talk about that? I uh, know, actually, uh, that's considered one of the, the points of difference between Judaism and, and Christianity, that uh, we don't have the doctrine of original sin, but perhaps um, Sandy and Dennis would like to add something. Well, well no, go ahead. I mean, we don't want to take it away from you guys. This, but, this you is know. your program. I think you have, you have answered it. So Rabbi Heschel never particularly um, addressed that. The only thing we would, we would say is that, in fact, in Judaism, we have a concept of original virtue rather than original sin. The human being, uh, enters the world filled with possibilities. And uh, it is uh, uh, in the process of growing up that, the, that we develop certain tendencies. The tradition does speak, speak about the human being being endowed with a uh, tendency uh, to tend a passion that can be driven in the direction of evil uh, and a passion that is driven in the direction of good that counters that. But even the passion that can lead for evil can be transformed into goodness, according to the tradition, if it's tempered by Torah and if it's tempered by, um, by good intentions. So I was going to add another one of your teachers who was in one of the pictures with uh, your father was uh, Robert Gordis, Rabbi Gordis about JGS. And he once 
said that a person is a sinner because he sins. He doesn't sin because he is a sinner. So wow. it, it's your activity that does it. You're not born as a sinner. You're born with a clean slate. So that's- so sin, is, sin is not a condition. It is- So a, there's, a, there's a general outline of maybe the difference, at least between Christian original sin, which we haven't delved into, uh, and nor nor will we at this point, and the Jewish <laughs> concept of sin. Uh, and if you want another Christian concept, I would go to Reinhold Niebuhr. There's nobody in the Protestant world uh, that spoke more about um, about original sin and the reality of, of human nature and destiny than uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. So that would be different too than the Catholic perspective on it. Yes. Okay, great. A um, couple other questions now. They're starting to flow in. Nancy Bate asks Susanna, did your father talk about feminism and how did he and your mother influence you becoming a feminist? <laughs> well, I think I was born a feminist. I think it's somehow in my genes. It just came out that way. Uh, but I, I have to say that when I was growing up and I listened to my father talk about certain very important elements of being a Jew, prayer, study, I would always say, well, if it's so important, why am I excluded? Why do I have to sit separately? And why can't I read from the Torah? And my father always agreed with me. And so when I wanted a bat mitzvah, for example, on Shabbat morning, which was just not done in those days in our circles, my father arranged it. And I wanted an aliyah for my 16th birthday. The only place in New York where I could do that was actually at SAJ. Uh, it was Rabbi Alan Miller who was there at that time. Um, so there were no arguments. My father one day, I was sitting at the table, dining table, and said, I don't know, what should I be when I grow up? And my father said, why don't you become a rabbi? And I said, oh, that's not going to happen. And he said, well, I think it might. Times are changing. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I, I never, ever, ever argued with my father about any feminist issue at all. Whatever I brought up, he listened and he, he agreed with me. Now, my mother didn't always agree with me. Uh, she was, um, but she at the same time would point out certain things. She was a pianist. There were no women who were concert pianists in her day. Maybe one or two, that's it. Alicia de la Rocha, for example, or Juan Olandowski, but it just wasn't done. So she was hampered in her career and it bothered her. Um, she pointed out, for example, certain prayers in the prayer book that, um, you know, the Mishiberach and Shabbat morning that calls for God's blessing on this congregation, its wives, sons, and daughters. Mm -hmm. As if the congregation is only the men who have wives. Mm -hmm. As if women aren't part of the congregation. And my mother pointed that to me one day when we were in the synagogue. <laughs> she was right. <laughs> but she was much more timid about uh, speaking publicly about such matters or publicly i've been speaking with you know speaking out she was now she was that we've speaking. opened kind of personal questions I, I want to extend this a step further if you don't mind and that is how do you feel your life would have been different and i'm not saying better because obviously you have a great deal of wisdom and scholarship and joy but how would your life have been different if you would have been born as a boy <laughs> my life would have been very different. Actually, the obstetrician apparently was quite worried that I might be a boy. I <laughs> believed that I was a girl because he thought I would be sent off to yeshiva somewhere. No, I, I think it would have been very different. And I have to say, I read an article recently. Um, I don't recall the names of the authors. It just somebody did a study. When girls are raised in a sexist environment, uh, certain regions of the country, for example, they will spend their lives, even if they move to a different part of the country and have a, an important job and a profession and so forth, nonetheless, they will never earn the same income as a man mm -hmm. or rise to the same level as a woman who was raised in an atmosphere that was supportive of women and women's careers. So in other words, how you're raised actually makes a difference. Um, it, I was, I was joke. I was raised in the Middle Ages. Nobody, nobody ah. said, I, they thought, well, you know, become a kindergarten teacher, maybe a social worker. My, my parents said, 
you should get a, you should go to college, you should get a master's degree. Because you, my mother would say, you need something to fall back on in case something happens to your husband. That's how people spoke in those days. And uh, my father said, don't, don't rush to get married. Wait, wait, be educated and so on. I think he was concerned also that I should, in fact, be educated, have a career, have a profession. But the idea of becoming a professor, I think, for a woman, there were no women professors around in my parents' circle. So somebody called up my mother <laughs> one day and said, may I speak to Dr. Heschel? And my mother said, oh, he's been dead a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, let, let me move on to another question. Bruce Sclair asked, did the rabbi see the Jews as the quote unquote chosen people in any sense? Well, so, you know, this was very important for Mordechai Kaplan that uh, this idea that we are chosen, uh, he felt something that was in fact, uh, in part responsible for antisemitism uh, but also just seemed highly inappropriate, even unethical, to say that we are somehow special uh, in that way. My, and, and, and Dr. Kaplan wanted it chosen is to be removed from the prayers. My father didn't agree with that, uh, but I think he felt uh, that to be a Jew, it's not so much about being chosen, but what does chosen mean? He means, means we have a mandate. We're given a mandate and you know, our life, he said, is not a gift. It's an obligation. We have a mandate. What do we do with the life that we're given? And what do we do as Jews? What's our mandate? What do we stand for? He said, to be a Jew isn't just to be, it's to stand for, to stand for certain principles, a certain way of behaving, a certain refinement of the person study was important extremely important for my father for every jew he actually found a book in the library of the yivo in new york that had stamped that this book belongs to the woodchopper society of berdichev that is there could be jews who were not particularly well educated who were day laborers and so on but what did they do at the end of the day, they went to the base medrash, they went to the local synagogue and they studied and they had a library. That's just one example. How you treat another person was very important for my father. It's a Jewish principle. So to be chosen really means to be given a mandate from my father. Thank you. You know, um, Lev, I was, I was gonna say that um, I'm old enough and, and was born and raised Roman Catholic and plenty old enough to be able to remember very keenly language in the Baltimore Catechism about the one true faith. So uh, you would not use the same, in the Catholic experience, you wouldn't use the language of chosen, but you would certainly use the language that said, we are among the elect. We are the special ones. Uh, and, and, and that I think would, could just be as problematic. Mm -hmm. Thank God you don't really hear that language on any side anymore. And I think that's part of the reason why we're able to make progress right now. We can confront social and political issues together because we're not competing against each other for deciding who has actually been chosen by God and to be elect. We're actually able to turn our attention, stand side by side and focus on the things at hand. And I think that's one of the big differences in the generation that young people are growing up in right now. I don't think they, I, there's so many, you have a wonderful interfaith organization there uh, led by Charlie uh, and the interfaith organization in, in um, Indianapolis. You're doing great things. And I think that's really a byproduct of the, of the great work that was done in the middle of the 20th century that got us to this particular time in history where churches and faith traditions can work together. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a great point. Um, and Martin, we have a question for you. And the question is, what is it that made you choose to be a filmmaker and to go into this particular type of film? Well, I, I, um, I, I, I don't think of myself first as a filmmaker. I don't. I, I think of myself first as somebody who's interested, deeply interested in God and God in the world and how people respond. 
And the vehicle that gives me the privilege of being able to inquire about that, search around and, and sort of legitimize my, myself is the filmmaking. And I get to sit down with people like Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson because I'm making a film, uh, but I'm re they're really first to understand how faith inter interacted with their lives and what brought them to be who they were. I get to sit around with people who are interested in religious subjects and spiritual topics. Mm. So the filmmaking becomes the vehicle for which I get the opportunity and the, pr the privilege really to explore these bigger themes that are really dear to my heart. So it was always first the, the, uh, the idea of religion. So I have my first degree is in religious studies. And then later I added on a degree in, in filmmaking. And that's how I think of the sequence in my own life. I find that very interesting because I, I sometimes tell people the same thing about what I do. The joy that I receive, for instance, right here, right now, to be able to work with people like Martin Doblemeyer, like Susanna Heschel, like Dennis and, Sa uh, Dennis and <laughs> Sandy Sasso, that I, I think I can understand what you're saying. The, the vehicle to do important things and to, to have the joy to talk to people and interact in a way that perhaps you wouldn't have. Lev, I can't ask this question on chat. So do you mind if I interrupt for a second? I, sure. Can Martin tell us what his next film is? I, I couldn't hear Sandy, sorry. What is your next film? Oh, why are you gonna make me break one of my cardinal rules? Oh, well, I'll sorry. do it for you, I will uh. do it for you. Um, we're, we're starting now a new two hour special uh, for public television on, that uh, the title of the film is Sabbath. Oh. Uh, and part wow. it's, it's come out, it's come out of the, the last readings, of course, by Abraham Joshua Heschel, who wrote the seminal book on Sabbath, but it's been an idea that's been sort of ruminating with me for a long, long time. And it becomes a vehicle to talk about the notion of rest, uh, the biblical commandment to rest in a culture that really doesn't know anything about rest. Um, the idea that we're called, now how we use that biblical commandment to rest as an opportunity and invitation to gather as community, how we're supposed to understand God, find a place of God for God in our hearts, learn about the cycles and the rhythms that we're all, that we're, we're breaking the traditions every single week and how we're supposed to live our lives, the patterns of our lives, so I, I think it's, it's a rich, rich story and we're just getting, getting going on it now. So. Thank you. I, I can't wait to see that film. That sounds wonderful. Thanks. Okay, uh, two more questions. One is from Bonnie Maurer, who is a poet and an artist right here in Indianapolis. And she said, I've been trying to read Heschel and read about him. It appears he was very much engaged in writing poetries and his works are poetic but he supposedly was criticized for writing in this manner. Could you comment on his style and the reaction to this? Well, let me say that uh, my father was born in Warsaw and then went to Vilna for a year to study at a gymnasium. That's a high, Vance High School. And there he became involved with a group of Yiddish poets called Jung Vilna, a famous group with Sutskova, for example, Chaim Grada was involved and so on. And my father wrote a small volume of poetry that he published uh, that was dedicated to his father. Um, and then in Berlin as a student, he occasionally wrote some poems um, in German as well as in Yiddish. Uh, but it, when, I, when you read his work, and he wrote books in four languages, German, English, Hebrew, and Yiddish, those books uh, are all magnificent, but the language of the English books is really quite special and highly poetic, much more so than the books that he wrote in the 30s in Germany in German, or even his Hebrew and Yiddish writings. There was something about that English, which is a language my father acquired after he came to this country while he was living during World War II in Cincinnati. But he also studied the English language. And I have some of the books that he bought in those days. What is a metaphor, for example, trying to understand how the English language works. He read a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of English language poetry, and also King James translation of the Bible. So he, he filled himself with the most beautiful English and it comes out in his books. 
Wonderful. First. Oh, and the other uh -huh. thing was that you would, the question was, yes, when I was a child, some people from the seminary colleagues of my father's would say to me, oh, you know, your father's work is just poetry. <laughs> and you know, you think about it, who does that? Who goes up to the child of a colleague oh. and says something disparaging to her about her father? It's just not a normal way to behave. But the other thing is, what do you mean just poetry? Right. So right. Shakespeare, T.S. Eliot, there's just words, there's just oh. something pretty, it has no meaning, no substance. So these people obviously knew nothing about poetry for one thing, but they also didn't, they didn't know how to understand my father because he really was in a different realm, intellectually and spiritually. Mm. And so in his own lifetime, he was not as appreciated the way he is today. And I'm sorry that he is not here to experience that. Yes. Well, he lives on. Before you close it, um, Lev, um, if I could just ask a very brief response to this question from both Susanna and Martin. Your father uh, is, no, is known to have said, something is asked of us. So my question to the two of you is, what is asked of us at this time? as we're about to close this, this conversation. Well, I'll, I'll take the easy one first. We'll let Susanna finish it off. I, I'll say that um, the films that we do are all based on a notion, a simple notion that this is really narrative theology. Um, we have the opportunity through film uh, to explore deep theological ideas or deep as we can get and see them lived out in the lives of people. So to me, I, I think that uh, seeing Abraham Joshua Heschel standing at the front of the line in Selma, wrapped arm in arm with people of different faith traditions from different cultures, uh, brings to bear the fact that we're all called uh, to be in partnership, partners in the work with God and for the transformation of the world. I think that's what he was fundamentally all about, the transformation of the world, and that's what's asked of us. Um, and he lived it out that day. That, that photograph is famous not only because uh, it's an iconic moment in American history, but it's, it stands as a symbol for so much more than just people lining up to change laws in this country. It's about the idea that people of different faith traditions, different cultures, different color can come together. And I think ultimately, I think he, he embedded the notion in, uh, that this is, this is what is asked of us. And, and I think he did it with joy and he knew that there was some risk to be there on the front lines in Selma, Alabama. We try to bring that out but he understood that, that was what was being asked of him. As, as Susanna said, it was a moral choice that had to be made. And once you, do, once you think of it in that context, what you're supposed to do becomes rather self-evident. Okay. Um, Susanna, did you wanna to respond to that? I'll just say briefly that I, I think there's a great deal of anger in, uh, in this country right now. And so I think one one mandate that we have at the moment is to try to soften hardened hearts and to i i i guess the the fear and my father felt that this country is a bit precarious it's a young country the democracy is precarious we have an obligation as jews to this country rescued my father saved his life I owe my life to this country. What can we do to change the mood? I think that's an obligation for all religious people. The other thing I would say is that my father was someone who was always open to other people, to ideas, to books. He didn't have to agree, but he would always listen. There was someone in the civil rights movement, Bernice Reagan, who said, you know, if you're in an alliance with people who agree with you, that's not an alliance. How can we come together with people we disagree with and somehow nonetheless find principles that transcend our differences when we speak working for justice, for example, the overcoming hatred? That seems to me right now a terribly important thing for us to do, including for us as Jews. We're polarized 
Much of it is around Israel and Israeli politics. Whatever our views are, we still need to support one another, to listen, to understand, to look for the good and to look for transcending moral principles that can possibly unite us and not polarize us. And I know that would have been very important to my father right now. Thank you both. Thank you. Yes, thank you for carrying on the tradition. The last question is very simple, and that is where can one get a copy of this film? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's always nice to hear. Um, the film is available if they just come to our website. It's Journey Films, J O U R N E Y F I L M S dot com. And uh, they can come to journeyfilms.com and get the film. And in addition to the film itself, we have a lot of educational material. So how to use the film in, there it is. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, you can get the film. Uh, you can also get all the free download of the educational material, which uh, we know is being used in congregations around the country and schools and uh, Sabbath schools and things. So we're, we're hopeful that it'll continue to be an important tool and, and, and useful for many years. So you can go to Amazon and get it, uh, but uh, I, if you come to Journey Films, you can actually get all the educational material there too. And we're not giving up on bringing the two of you to yeah. Indianapolis <laughs> in the near future. We would that would be great. I'd be honored. I'd be honored. So that's journeyfilms.com. And I know we have more questions, but I think it's, it's time that we close. I want to, to thank very deeply Susanna, Martin, Dennis, and Sandy for your wisdom and your generosity. I want to thank Jackie Goldstein, who is the wizard that makes all of this technically work. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, especially the Lilly Endowment and the congregation and congregation Beth El Zedek. I want to thank each and every one of you who are out there for joining us. And most of all, our deepest gratitude goes to Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel for showing us what is possible with faith, will, curiosity, and a powerful moral compass. Thank you, Liv. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go away, my my what shameless pitch please do join us for our excellent our other excellent festival books and art programs and you can learn about them and register for them at our website jccindy.org and with that i do thank you all very very much blessings thank you so oh, much everybody. thank you so much all right guys thank you all thank you Great to see you. Thanks. So good. We'd like to see you in person next time. Yes. I hope so soon. Looking forward. Bye. Bye. Bye.